And with that being said, today is the second to last part, part 15 of our summer study through the book of James that we've been calling Little Bro, given the fact that most scholars believe that James is the little brother of Jesus. And last week, as you'll remember, I told you we were only going to talk through one verse, which was James 2.13, but we were actually only going to talk about one sentence in that verse. Last week, we only covered the second sentence in James 2.13, and that's because we reserved sentence number one for today. And so if you're already there, which you should be, especially if you're not brand new to our church, you knew we were in this series, if you're in the book of James, let's go ahead and let's reread James 2.13. It'll be up on the screen behind me, and it says this, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I'm going to use sentence number one here to preach a message that we're going to refer to as the ministry of mercy, the ministry of mercy. And as you'll recall, last Sunday, we spent pretty much all of our time covering this idea that as it goes with God's attributes, his attribute of his love and his mercy triumphs over and is actually better than his judgment and his wrath. And personally speaking, I think it's one of the most encouraging verses in the entire Bible. And Jesus himself actually echoes this same verse whenever he gives us his most famous parable, which we would know as the parable of the prodigal son. The story of a kid who deeply dishonors his dad and he drags his family's name through the mud by going and wasting all of his dad's money and wild living and hooking up with prostitutes and week-long benders. And then only after the results of his actions, only after the consequences have caught up with him and he's run out of money and he has nothing else to turn to, it's not like he had this massive change of heart. He ran out of money and didn't have another option. Only after that happens does he go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe I should go back and live with dad again because I had it pretty good back at home. But the issue is my dad might be mad at me, so maybe he'll let me go be one of his servants. And when the original listeners were hearing this story, they would have assumed that when he goes to approach dad and ask him to let him come back into the house, that dad was gonna give him exactly what he deserved. That dad was gonna say, absolutely not. You left, you go do your own thing. You drug our family's name through the mud. That's on you. You made your bed, now sleep in it. And as we talked about last week, that's not what happens at all. It says the father sees him coming from a long way off. And even though the father knew it would bring humiliation upon himself, he takes off running after his kid. And he showers him with hugs and kisses and love and compassion. He gives him everything that he left behind, the sandals, the robe, the ring, and then goes and throws an entire party for his son. For me personally, I think that outside of Jesus on the cross, that is the most beautiful picture of God's mercy triumphing over his judgment that we have in the entire biblical canon. But for those of you who have ever actually read the story of the prodigal son, you know that last week we stopped short. We didn't finish the story because if you keep reading this story, you'll find out that the dad didn't just have one boy. He had two sons. And even though the younger son left, there was an older son who stayed behind. He was at the house doing what he was supposed to be doing. And he didn't really appreciate the mercy displayed by the father. And so today, we're gonna cover the older son and his story. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 15. I'll give you a second to turn there, knowing that I took you by surprise on that one. Just so you know, when we start this story, we'll skip past most of the story of the prodigal son, and at this point, he's already made his journey home. He's recited his speech to his father, and as you'll remember, the speech starts off like this. He says, Dad, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son, and then the dad interrupts him, and he says this. Let's check it out. Luke 15, starting in verse 22, but the father interrupts, and he says to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they begin to celebrate. And now we get to verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and he asked what all this meant. And the servant said to him, your brother's come back and your father's killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But the older brother was angry and he refused to go into the party. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his dad. He said, look, all these years I've served you and I have never disobeyed your command. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I could even celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours comes home who's devoured your property with prostitutes, suddenly you go and you kill the fatted calf for him? And the father replies, son, you're always with me, and all that's mine is yours. And it was fitting to celebrate and be glad because your brother was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. Now, I don't know if this is how they still do it. I should know because my mother is a teacher, and she has been for like 25 years. Am I going on? This is my little brother up here. A long time, long time, longer than he's been alive. <laughs> been a teacher for a long time, but you guys remember that old system in elementary school where they had to pull your card if you did something wrong? Anybody, just by a show of hands, you ever get your card pulled? You know what I'm, just by a show of hands, you know what I'm talking about. If I'm gonna go through this whole, okay. Yes, you start off with a green card, and then you talk, and you get it pulled, and you have a yellow card, and then you hit someone, and you get it pulled, and you have an orange card, and it's like, oh, you're really treading on thin ice at this point because you don't want to get to a red card because if you get that orange card pulled, you get a red card. You're going to go to the principal. Your parents are going to get called. You're going to get in a bunch of trouble. But if you don't get your card pulled, then at the end of the day, you wind up in a drawing where maybe you can get something out of a treasure chest or out of a treasure box. Do you remember this train of events? I love this event because I was a great student. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't talk. I obeyed the teachers. And I wanted the little erasers and the little pencil grippers and all that different stuff that they had in the treasure boxes. I love that kind of stuff. My wife, on the other hand, hated this practice. And it's not because she was a bad student. You say, ooh, it's not. It's not because she was a bad student. It's actually the opposite. It's because she was a great student. She probably talked less than me. She was very honoring, very respectful. She hates breaking the rules. And in her mind, if she obeyed the rules, then at some point, she was going to get to get something out of the treasure box. And then more often than not, that didn't happen. And that's because the teacher that she had that year, in an effort to promote good behavior from students who didn't always have good behavior, if there was a student who normally got their card pulled but didn't get it pulled on that day, the teacher would go and handpick that student and let them get something out of the treasure chest. And for people like Sam, who were always respectful, who were always good and who always listened, they kind of thought that this was an injustice. It didn't feel fair because it always left them feeling perpetually undervalued and overlooked. And this is exactly where the older brother finds himself in this story. We always give him such a bad rap for his sour attitude, but if we're being honest, he's got some pretty legit grievances. I mean, think about the first description that we have of older bro. It's in verse 25. And it says that he was working in the field, meaning that while little bro was out and about sinning, hooking, hooking up with prostitutes, going on benders, wasting his dad's fortune and making a mockery of their family, older bro was back home. He was doing the work. He was modeling consistency. He was obeying dad. He was learning the scriptures, committed to his prayers, serving dad's church. I mean, serving dad's house faithfully every single week. And then suddenly, immature, irresponsible, sinful little brother shows up out of nowhere and dad goes and throws him a party? The guy who starts all this drama in the family, suddenly he gets to get a prize out of the treasure chest? The big brother's like, no, I'm not going to his stupid party. This kid doesn't deserve to be celebrated. He deserves to get punished. He deserves justice. He deserves to have to face the consequences for his actions. And in acting like that, in saying this, the older brother models for us a timeless principle in that you can be a part of the father's home and still completely miss the father's heart. Did you know that? I, it's great that you're at church. I'm so happy you're at church. I'm happy you're a part of this church. You can give. You can go to a next step day. You can get in a small group. You can become a leader on a team. You can go to flow night. You can jump up and down. You can pray in tongues. You can, be a, you can be saved. You can be a part of the Father's home. And you can still miss the Father's heart the whole time. But if you want to be a part of the Father's home and share the Father's heart, right now, you have to decide that you're okay with the fact that the Father's heart is always bent toward mercy. It's always bent toward mercy. In fact, if the older brother really knew his dad, if he really knew his dad's heart, none of this would have come as a surprise. Because it's not like he'd never benefited from his dad's love and grace and mercy and compassion before. When you read the beginning of this story, you remember where it says, when the younger son asked for his inheritance, it says the father divided his wealth between his two sons. The older brother saw it then. 
He received the inheritance. He already had the same money that the younger son had. He saw the father's love. He saw his compassion. And that's not to mention the fact that he grew up with his dad. He knew it was there. But let's take it another level into this thing. Let's look at Luke 15, 28 through 29 again. It says, the older brother was angry and he refused to go into the party. And his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his dad, look, all these years, I've served you and I have never, not one time, I've never disobeyed your command. And yet you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. You wanna know what we just read? The delusional words of a kid who is high on himself. He was sincerely convinced that he deserved more love and affection and attention from his dad because he, unlike his little brother, he doesn't break dad's rules and he never has, not once, which is what we here in the South refer to as a steaming pile of hot garbage. That is not the truth. Obviously, you know that's not the truth. I mean, practically, if you have a child or let's just say if you've ever been someone's child, you already know that there's never been a single human being born that obeyed their parents 100% of the time. Never a single time outside of Jesus has that person ever existed. But then theologically speaking, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. And here's the thing. It's not just that we've sinned. We've sinned in multiple ways. We've not just sinned against God. We've sinned against God in a lot of different ways, and there's actually two different ways that God talks about how we sin against him. The first way that we read about in the Bible, the first type of sin is what we refer to as a transgression. That's when you commit a sin. You go out and you do the thing that you're not supposed to do when you punch someone in their face. And then the second type of sin is called an iniquity. And that deals with the motives of your heart your desires. It deals with the thing that you don't always act on, but you wanted to do. It's you wanting to punch somebody in the face. According to God, even though the real life consequences of those two things are very different, in his eyes, those two things are still equally considered sins. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus literally says, it's not less sinful for you to want to sleep with someone that you're not married to than it is for you to go and actually do it. He says it's not less sinful for you to harbor anger and bitterness towards someone than it is for you to actually go and murder them. Now, of course, the real life consequences of those things are very different. But again, in the eyes of God, they're equally considered sins against God. It's not like, well, that's a sin against God. And that's just a don't worry about doing that. Don't do that. That's bad. That's, you, know, you know that. Have you ever thought about how Adam and Eve threw the world into the curse of sin? They didn't murder someone. They ate fruit. God doesn't have this, this scale, this grading scale of which sins like he, he really hates and which sins he's like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. No, he hates it all. It's all, according to him, it's all sin. And so now you have to remember who Jesus originally tells the story of the prodigal son to. Of course, he's telling it to regular everyday people like all of us, but he's also talking to a large crowd of Pharisees, people who consider themselves atop the religious food chain. People who thought that they were the spiritually elite and they were pretty much better than everybody else because of their wildly impressive and holy lifestyles. Or in other words, in modern day terminology, they were the really impressive church people. You know what I'm saying? They're not just the average attenders that you see twice a month. They were the real impressive church people, the people who knew the Bible better than anybody else, the people who prayed more confidently than everybody else, the people who worshiped with passion, the people who served on all the teams, the people who were leaders, the people who have picture-perfect families and were held in high esteem in their communities. And because of that, the Pharisees saw themselves as the godliest and least sinful people in the world. They saw themselves as those who were closest to God's heart and those whom God was closest to and liked the most himself. But you wanna know how Jesus really felt about the Pharisees? You wanna know how Jesus feels about anyone who sees themselves like that? Let's check it out. This is Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Just read it along with me. Jesus says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law, church people, church leaders, and Pharisees, <laughs> you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, 
which look really beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of dead people and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people that are righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, that verse isn't bone-chilling enough, because it should be. The more terrifying reality of these verses is that we've all been there. Let's go ahead and own it. We've all been there. At some point in your life, you have considered yourself, you, you've wanted to be seen as outwardly better than someone else. You've wanted to be seen as the person who had it all together. You wanted to be seen as the person who had all the right answers. At some point in your life, you've seen yourself as better than or holier than or more spiritually impressive than someone else because of their issues or their beliefs or their politics or the way that they worship. But here's the terrifying reality. Behind the facade that we all project, that facade of the Bible stuff that you share on social media, the facade of your church attendance and your giving and how much you serve on that team and your passionate worship and attending the prayer meetings and your, your giving and the offerings, behind that facade, oftentimes, if we were to pull back that mask, all we would find is, is a toxic desire to be liked and held in high esteem by everybody else. A toxic desire to be one seen as the spiritually elite and impressive person. You peel, that, peel back that facade, and sometimes, sometimes all you find is just a load of bitterness, that even though you've read the words of Jesus, you're still holding bitterness against your parents, and against your coworkers, and against your old boss, and against your spouse. You peel back that facade, and sometimes you just find a secret affair, or a secret addiction to alcohol, or drugs, or pornography, or food. Sometimes you peel it back, and you find this tendency to lie about yourself, and to over-exaggerate about your accomplishments so that you can look better to everybody else. And sometimes we peel it back and we just see a big load of self-righteousness. I know what self-righteousness is. It's when on the outside, you are so great. You love people, you're committed to them growing. You wanna be a mentor, you wanna be wise to people, but in reality, you wanna know why you want that? It's because you wanna be seen as the mentor. You wanna be seen as the wise. You, you love feeling like, man, they don't pray in tongues and I do, how much better am I than them? They don't know how to prophesy. I've never seen them raise their hands during worship. They're only here twice a month. It's that feeling that you get when you feel like you're better than someone else because of something that you do or some kind of skill that you feel like you have. That's, that's the issue. And you know what's really crazy? The issue isn't that any of that will keep the Father from loving you. The issue is that oftentimes we're well aware of just how broken and sinful and messy we are and we are well aware of just how much God does love us and how much mercy he showers on us even despite our worst problems, and yet we still refuse to extend that same kind of mercy to other people despite their problems. That's the issue because as people who consider ourselves to be in the family of God, one of the defining factors that's supposed to set us apart from people in the kingdom of the world is our willingness to absolutely shower people with unreasonable amounts of mercy and compassion and love and forgiveness at all times. And according to the scriptures, God gives us a hefty warning if that isn't the case. And that warning is seen in James 2.13. Let's read it again. Judgment is without mercy to someone who has not shown any mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I haven't preached much about the end times. I haven't preached much about the book of Revelation, and that's mainly because I'm still growing in my understanding of the book of Revelation, and I don't wanna get up here and spew out a bunch of nonsense that is not even true to you. And when that time comes, you'll know it and you'll all be shook because there's gonna be some things that you thought were true that are simply not true. But for now, let me give you a nugget about the end times. You may not know this, but according to the Bible, there are two judgments that all Christians are gonna have to go through. Now that should already make your eyes go up because some of you just know every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on that day that Jesus is Lord and then some people will go to hell and some people will go to heaven and that's it. But that's not it. There's actually two judgments in the Bible, and do me a favor, I want you to write this down, because if you come back to me later on and you ask for the names of these judgments or the scripture references and you don't have them in your notes, I'm not gonna help you. I'm just gonna say, go back and watch the sermon, okay? So I want you to write them down now so that you, go, you can go and read this stuff yourself. The first judgment is called 
the great white throne judgment, the great white throne judgment. And we see this in Revelation 20. Now, when you write Revelation, don't write Revelation, write R-E-V, Rev 20, all right, so that you can take notes pretty quick. Great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, John 5, Daniel 12. That's Dan 12, for those of you taking notes, okay? Christians pass through this judgment simply through being Christian. That's it. All you gotta do is be a Christian. You'll be a follower of Jesus. If you place your faith in Jesus, if you've been purchased by the blood of the lamb, if you've been washed by the blood of the lamb, if your name is in the lamb's book of life, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus via the fruit of repentance and change, if that has been the case, then in this judgment, whenever it comes, you'll pass through. Now, for those that haven't, for anyone who's an atheist, for anyone who's not a Christian, for anyone who maybe at one point in their life was following Jesus and then they turn from the truth, during this judgment, they will inherit eternal separation from God, otherwise known as hell. But that's not where it ends for Christians. For Christians, there is a second judgment. I want you to write this down. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Let me give you some verses to go check out. This is 2 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 3 and 4. That's 2 C-O-R 5 and 1 C-O-R 3 and 4. Just so y'all know. Romans 14, 2 Timothy 4, and right here in James chapter 2. This judgment is solely reserved for believers, meaning that at this point, we will be with Christ. We will be residing in eternity. Your eternal destination is not up for grabs in this judgment, but what is happening is is that on this day, we will stand before Jesus and Christians will give an account of every word that comes out of our mouth, of every dollar we spent, of how we spent our time, and of every action that we did as someone claiming to be a follower of Jesus. And we will either receive rewards or we will be denied rewards based on how we lived as followers of Jesus. And here in James 2.13, we are told that if we refuse to show mercy to other people in this life, then God will not show us mercy in the next one, which isn't as crazy as you would think, and it's not the first time this has ever been mentioned because Jesus himself suggests this exact same idea. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Mark 6, 14 through 15. This is Jesus speaking. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others for their sins... Your heavenly Father will not forgive you for your sins. That's a tough one to wrestle with, isn't it? And it's like I so desperately want to be the guy who makes that easier for you, who helps that sit with you a little bit more comfortably, but I'm not going to do it. It shouldn't make you comfortable at all. It should be tense. It should incite a little bit of the fear of the Lord because Jesus, Jesus is literally saying, he's saying, you know just how merciful God's been to you. And yet when it comes time for you to judge what somebody else deserves, you can so quickly come to the conclusion that they don't deserve any mercy, that they don't deserve to be forgiven. He said, even though I've showered my mercy on you time after time after time, day after day after day, even though I've forgiven you of all of your sins, past, present, and future, you still can't forgive others of theirs. You still won't show mercy to them. Well, okay. Then when it comes time for your judgment day, I'm not gonna show mercy to you either. It's pretty intense, and what I'm about to say is gonna shake some of you up real good too. Christians are not called to participate in cancel culture. We are called to champion the way for mercy culture. Now, let me expound by exactly what I mean when I say that. Our expectation, our calling as Christians is this. Whether it's, it's showing mercy to people, meaning whether that's showing mercy to the celebrity when they make a mistake, whether it's showing mercy to the pastor who gets involved in a slimy scandal, whether it's showing mercy to the friend who treated you bad, to the family member who continually uh, steps over your boundaries, to the boss who does something that you don't feel like they should have done to you, whether it's showing mercy to your spouse when they told you they'd have the dishes washed when you got home, but they don't have the dishes washed when you got home, or whether it's showing mercy to the kid who goes and makes a mockery of his family and wastes every dollar that his dad had. We, as followers of Jesus and as people within the kingdom of God, in the same way, 
that the Father extends mercy to us every day, people who reside in the Father's house, children of the Father, are called to the Father's business. We're called to act like the Father. We're called to the Father's ministry, which is not a ministry of condemnation or cancellation. It is a ministry of mercy and restoration. All that said, that does not mean it's wrong to correct people when they are in error. It doesn't mean it's wrong to call people out on sin. It doesn't mean it's wrong to correct a brother or sister when she's you know, off the wayward path of Jesus. And it also doesn't mean that there should never be any type of consequence for sinful behavior. Okay, there is a time and a place for all of that according to the New Testament and obvious fairs to say that like consequences for sinful behavior is actually the way that God protects his church from people that sometimes aren't even Christians at all. But even with all that being said, For Christians to be in the ministry of mercy, it means that our responsibility as people who've experienced the unwarranted, undeserved love, mercy, and grace of God through faith in Jesus, it means that in the same way that we've experienced that, we have to make sure that people, especially Christians, when they sin and when they fail, that they're still offered ridiculous amounts of mercy and grace and love and compassion. They're still treated with dignity and they're still consistently reminded that within the kingdom of God, they still have value, they still have purpose, they're still loved and they still have a seat at the table. And I know that most of us can hear that and go, yeah, that's right. That's what we're supposed to do. And most of us would even say, I agree and I am willing to shower mercy on people as long as they repent and come back home. As long as they say they're sorry. As long as they own up for all their bad decision making. As long as they change the way they're living like the little brother did in that story. As long as they do that, then I'd never be like the big brother. I'd never withhold mercy as long as he comes back. Of course, I'm gonna shower them with mercy, but I'd like to fight for this idea that the, little, the, the big brother's role in this story wasn't to just sit around and wait for little brother to come to his senses and come back home and apologize. The big brother's role was to leave dad's house, go chase down his little brother, and drag him back home. That, that was his role, and the reason that I can say that is because I believe the apostle James wholeheartedly agrees with that sentiment. Let me prove it to you. Let's read James 5, 19 through 20. Up front, this is, this is the very end of the book of James, meaning that next week we only have six verses left to cover and then we've completed our series. James 5, 19 through 20. My brothers, and I love that word right there. I almost used the NIV because it says brothers and sisters, but I stuck with the ESV this time. On, on the count of three, say brothers. One, two, three. Brothers. My brothers, if anyone among you, if anyone among brothers were to wonder from the truth, and then someone were to say, go bring him back, just let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wondering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now again, this is the very last line in James' letter. And it's at this point that it's safe to start wondering if maybe James had heard the story of the prodigal son because some of what he has to say almost starts feeling a little personal. And this is what I mean. If there was anyone who has ever existed that would know what a healthy relationship between an older brother and a younger brother was supposed to look like, James is that guy. And even though we covered this week one of this series, y'all weren't, not all y'all were here for week one of this series, so I think this is going to be a good reminder. In James's situation, he was the little brother who made the mistakes. He wasn't always the apostle James. He wasn't always the loving brother, faithful follower, and dedicated servant of Christ Jesus our Lord. No, no, no. He was Jesus's little brother who for at least a time period did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He was Jesus's little brother who effectively turned his back on the heavenly father and on his family. But the difference with James is that not only did he have a heavenly father who loved him and who was ready to shower him with hugs and love and kisses and mercy and compassion at a moment's notice, but James also had an older brother who was actively doing the exact same thing. An older brother 
who was devoted to making sure that he came back to his senses. An older brother who would have done anything to make sure that he did not get the consequences of his actions. An older brother who gave up his own life so that he could wake up and come home. And an older brother who all but DJ'd the party when that actually happened. I mean, have you ever considered how James felt the moment it all clicked? Think about the moment it all clicked for James. All these years, Jesus has been his brother, and he's been skeptical of the things that his mom had to say, of the things his dad told him when he was young, of the things that Jesus was saying. He wasn't one of his followers when Jesus, he wasn't one of the disciples. James wasn't one of Jesus' own disciples. He wasn't following him. And then Jesus gets crucified on the cross, and James is probably like, I knew it. Like, I wish he hadn't said all that stuff. I tried to warn him. I tried to tell him that he was towing the line, like he was going a little bit too far, and now he's gone. And then Jesus raises from the dead, and he's like, hey, dude, (laughs) can you imagine that moment for James where he goes, all this time, I've called you a liar, and I've said that you were crazy, and I didn't believe you, and yet it was all true. You really are who you say you are. Now, I can't say this with certainty. I'm definitely reading into the story, but I could only imagine that if James were to apologize to Jesus, it might sound like the little brother apologizing to his father. Jesus, I've sinned against you in heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your father. I'm no longer worthy to be called your brother. And then Jesus interrupts. And he says, hey, you see these scars on my wrist? You see these scars on my feet? You saw me get beat up on the cross? You saw my bloody body? Brother, that was for you. So how about about let's just go get some lunch and let's celebrate because my little brother who was once lost is now found and my little brother who was once dead is now alive. Undoubtedly, pulling on some of his own personal experiences along with the entire storyline of the whole Bible, ranging from Genesis to Revelation. You do know the whole, the whole Bible is about sibling rivalries, right? The whole thing. Go read the book of Genesis. It's all about it. The whole Bible is about it. Pulling on the entire narrative of Scripture. James is trying to tell us that the people you love people you respect, people that you look at right now and you say, we're going to be friends forever. They're going to let you down. They're going to fall short on their promises. They're going to betray you. They're going to have bad days. They're going to chase after sin. They might leave your church. They might leave the church altogether and they may wander off the path of following Jesus for a time period. And when that happens, do not hesitate to fight for their restoration. Don't wait. Don't wait around. Fight for their restoration. Fight for their reconciliation. Even though your natural tendency is going to want to be executing judgment on them for their actions. Even though your natural tendency is going to want to be saying things like they don't deserve to be in my life. Or you know what? They made their decision. That's on them and I can't do anything about it. James is saying, no, you can do something about it. You initiate the conversation. You send the text. You talk to them. You call them out. You invite them over to come over to your house because just like our big brother Jesus, we are called to the ministry of mercy. It's your calling. It's your purpose. It's the family that you're a part of. If God is slow to anger, if God's judgment walks and his mercy runs, then the same has to be said about us as his children. We are slow to anger. Our judgment walks and our mercy runs. Whether it's someone who has deliberately sinned against you and traumatized you, whether it's someone who's turned their back on the church, left the church, or made a mockery of the church online, whether it's someone who let you down repeatedly, lied about you behind your back, treated you poorly, even for them, God's mercy still triumphs over his judgment, meaning that our mercy should triumph over our judgment because we're a part of Jesus's church. This isn't Alex's church. This isn't Overflow Church. This isn't your church. This is Jesus's church. You're a part of the global body of Christ. We're a part of Jesus's family. And you know what Jesus's family business is? The ministry of mercy. 
Jesus did not show up on the scene with the intentions of making bad and broken people feel horrible for how bad and broken they are. You already feel bad for how bad and broken you are. That's why some of you can't even look into the mirror because you hate yourself and you know how much of a liar you are and you know how much of a fraud you are and how much of a hypocrite you feel. We don't need help feeling bad about how broken we are and Jesus knows that. And let's, I wanna show you what Jesus showed up to do. Look at Matthew 9, 36. Matthew 9, 36. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let me read it again. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and they were helpless. They were sheep without a shepherd. Jesus does not view humanity as some disgusting problem that needs to be dealt with. Jesus does not view selfish or mean people as a disgusting problem that needs to be dealt with. Jesus doesn't view, view the LGBTQ plus community as a disgusting problem that needs to be dealt with. Jesus doesn't view Democrats or Republicans as a disgusting problem that needs to be dealt with. Jesus doesn't view criminals or addicts as a disgusting problem that needs to be dealt with. And here's the most encouraging part. Jesus doesn't view you as a disgusting problem that needs to be dealt with. Jesus sees us for who we are, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And I promise you, if we began seeing people like that, if we began treating people in the same way that Jesus treated people, instead of complaining about them behind their back and talking about them and making them the butt of every joke and posting about them on social media and being angry with them and holding bitterness against them, if we started treating people like Jesus treated people, my guess is that we'd start seeing some of the same results that Jesus saw. And what were those results? Let's look one verse back at Matthew 9, 35. It says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news of the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Healing is the end goal of everything that Christianity is all about. Healing of the world, healing for the individual, healing for families, and people experiencing emotional, relational, physical, and spiritual healing is what happens when they begin to encounter the love and compassion and mercy of Jesus through you, through the person who's called to the ministry of mercy. Do me a favor, stand up on your feet. All right, without talking and moving around and getting all your stuff ready, do me one more favor. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Come on, everybody all over the room. I don't want you focusing on what's happening on the stage or to me. I want you to close your eyes for a second. Lord, we apologize for our refusal to display the ministry of mercy. We apologize for directly disobeying you and refusing to display the ministry of mercy to our spouses, to our friends, to pastors that we read about, to our parents, to people that left the church, to people that treated us bad at our old church. We're sorry for refusing to extend the ministry of mercy to people who hurt us, who said untrue, untrue things about us. God, to anybody, we repent for being so quick in administering justice and judgment when you haven't done that to us. We're sorry. Lord, forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us for being pathetic brothers and sisters. Forgive us for missing the mark. We don't want to see ourselves as better or more deserving of your love than anybody else. We don't want to see ourselves as the spiritually elite. We don't want to see ourselves as the non-annoying people who never do anything wrong. Thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the infinite amount of mercy and compassion and forgiveness that you've shown us. We want to be people who do the same thing. We want to be people who don't just live in the Father's home, but who share the Father's heart. Teach us what it means to be in your home and to share your heart and to share your business.
which is the ministry of mercy. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, I'll be honest with you. For most of you in here, your response today is asking God, like, what does this mean for me practically? Is there someone you need to text? Is there someone you need to call? Is there a conversation you need to have? Is there a social media post you need to take down? Is there, do you need to get with God and repent for being judgmental and being mean and holding bitterness in your heart? Do you need to extend mercy to someone in your life? If so, go and do it. Go do it. When you leave here today, go make it happen. But I'll be honest, there may be some of you in here who don't identify with the older brother in this story. You don't identify with withholding mercy and being judgmental and being bitter because maybe you identify with the younger brother in the story. You're like, man, I still feel like I'm far from home. I left home and I need, I need to experience the ministry of mercy myself. I'm ready to come back. I'm ready to make a fresh start with God. If so, I wanna give you that opportunity today. Whether you need to make a fresh start with God for the first time or for the first time in a long time, I'm gonna lead you through a prayer in a moment. We're gonna pray this out loud and all together as a church, but before we do, I wanna make sure you understand what we're doing and what we're not doing. This isn't some magic phrase that you pray so that you don't have to wind up in hell for all of eternity. That is not what this is. This is us saying that Jesus, I turn from my sin, from my way, and from my truth. I repent for who I used to be. And I turn to you, to your way, to your truth, to your life. I surrender everything over to you. I'm holding nothing back. And in return, I'm gonna receive your mercy and your friendship, your love, and your forgiveness. That's what's happening in this moment. If that's what you need, then when we pray this, I want you to pray with passion. I want you to pray with faith, knowing that all it takes for you to become right with God is solely placing your faith in Jesus as God's son who died on the cross for your sins, rose from the grave, and you repenting from your sin. That is it. That is all God's looking for from you. He will take care of the rest later. It's what we call discipleship. But for those of you who need to make that fresh start, let's make it a little bit easier. Close your eyes. Close your eyes all over the room. Now, 945, when we pray this, I need you to pray this like a Christian. I need you to pray this as if you believe that salvation is the most important thing that will ever happen to anybody ever. Meaning you, you simply cannot whisper this. I need you to pray this on behalf of the person sitting next to you who might be too afraid to pray it. But when they hear you, they get that courage and they say yes to Jesus. And you may never know it, but because of your willingness to pray with a little bit of passion, they said yes and everything changed. You guys ready? If that's you and you need to make this fresh start, let's pray this together. Jesus, right now, I give you everything. Every word, every dollar, every moment, every decision. It's all yours. I turn from my way, my truth, and my life. I repent from my sins, and I turn to you, your way, your truth, your life. I believe that you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross, that you rose from the grave, and I place my faith in you. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, on the count of three, if you made a fresh start, we want to give a moment to celebrate that, to acknowledge that that happened. So I'm going to ask you on the count of three to shoot your hand up and overflow. Even if you don't see anybody raise their hand in faith, I need you guys to celebrate, to clap, and then we're going to sing for a second, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to get prayed for. You guys ready? Here we go. If that was you, one, two, three. I made a fresh start, man. I see you, dog. Come on. Don't stop. Let's lift up our voices. 